start this workshop session, and I would ask the clerk to please call roll. Marlin? Here. Cook? Here. Hopkins? Mud? Old Nettle? Here. Darren Scott? Here. Bill Scott? Here. Here. Wumble? Here. Wormowski? Williams? Here. I got to do that one. Come on. Mayor Edward? Here. 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 Thank you. First up, under the mayor's report this evening is a presentation by Ms. Sandy Newton. We'll take yes. it to the street. Sandy, you have the floor. Thank you. So we're back. <laughs> Third year going. Um, last year I came and thank you all for coming or for letting me come and speak with you today. So I've put around the board our little flyers here. So there is a definite need in Jacksonville for food for our children. And as my grandma said, it took a village to raise a child during the Depression, and I say it takes a community to feed a child. Last year, we fed 16,500 lunches. Um, it was overwhelming. The first day, we had 165 or so lunches, and by the end of the week, it was 225. Um, and then it just grew. There were three weeks, we had 415. So there is a definite need there. This year, we have seven sites. We have Walnut and Bass Housing, Greenbrier, Northwood Trailer Court, Monaco Village, Washington School, and South Jacksonville, the elementary <coughs> area. So um, we are just, I'm just letting you all know about it. It's free healthy lunches for children only. Um, we were fortunate we had 302 volunteers come in the evenings over 10 weeks, which was, this community is awesome. <laughs> I've only been here a few years, and I was just amazed at how many people would come out ages 3 to 98. Dorothy sat and she's 98. And we have three-year-olds that were putting bags in containers. What we do is we prepare the lunches the night before, we put them in containers with us for a site, put them in the refrigerators. The next day our volunteers, we had 52 last year, they take them out and take them to the sites and hand out the lunches, just as simple as that. Um, and so that's, that's, our food, that's our food program. And I wanted to let you know we're having a fundraiser and the Rotary, new Rotary was, uh, we were very grateful they're letting us um, set up a pork chop dinner or lunch on June the 1st and we'll have flyers everywhere. And they're gonna be having the fair still going along, which is like, woohoo! <coughs> and it's pork chops and chips and a soda for five bucks. So that's pretty cheap. <laughs> so, and all the money goes to the food program. I've been able to get it all together for the food program. So I wanted to also let you know, um, We've asked how are we helping the community with referrals, and I'm like, we're feeding the kids. So I've got this from the state, and it's on Jacksonville, like the places to go in case, you know, they want no legal aid, they want to know where to get things. And we'll be putting these in once a month, the first week of each month on pink, because they won't throw the paper away. Hopefully they'll see it. So that's mainly our food program. We're needing volunteers to help us at lunchtime, help hand out the lunches. Um, you know, and any time you'd like to come on Tuesday or a Wednesday or any time, please consider coming and helping us. We're at Grace at 5.30 on um, Monday through Thursday and Sundays we're at 4 because a lot of our ladies want to get out to the concert in the park. And they would literally drop whatever they were doing to go out to the concert in the park, whether you have it or not. So we're doing it at 4 o'clock. But you come down, we get you going. If you come, please wear a hat because those fancy little hairnets are a little expensive. So I'm very tight with the money. I have to be because we don't know. You know, this last year, it, first year, 8,700 lunches. Last year, 16,500. We don't know how many this year. We don't know. We don't turn a child away. And our first day is June the 10th, since they go to school into the first part of June. And the ninth is when we start. So please consider coming over and helping. Even if just one time you got that experience of saying, hey, I helped. And with 300, come on, that is pretty awesome. So anyway, I just want to thank you. If you all have any questions, any questions? It's kind of, everybody kind of noticed that. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your effort. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, next up, under the merit report, item number two, but certainly not item number two in our heart, Mr. Jack Cosner. <laughs> well, I got a clipboard and the props. 
fun, so. Look <laughs> out. I can speak in front of 300 people at a convention, at a convention but this is worse because I know all of you. Uh, I came to the city on July 21st of 89. I heard there was a job opening on a Friday, and uh, I was over here Monday morning with my resume in the mayor's office at 7.30, and Mayor Tendy could just take it over, and uh, luckily Dave Bias was in there, and they were discussing what they were going to do about the place of the guy. Within 15 minutes, I'd been interviewed, and I was on the way, so I was that lucked out. The next day was the 4th of July, and 8 o'clock on the 5th, I got the job. So good old days when things work pretty quick. <laughs> uh, I operated for eight years and then I went on lead maintenance crew with his dad, Ernie. Then in 2000 I became the assistant superintendent. And then in 2001 Dave Bias retired and then they offered me the superintendent's job that I didn't want it yet. So Pat Long came from the sewer department and he was the superintendent. And he was there for five years. And, uh, first thing he asked me, was, what do we need to do? Because he was basically sewer plant. And I was water and sewer collection. So I said, well, we need to hire a person. And we did that. And then I said, we need to start repairing sewer mains and manholes and replace water mains. And uh, so, take one. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, as far as equipment, when I went on the truck with Ernie, we had nothing. Uh, we didn't have a backhoe, jackhammer, nothing. You take a three hour water main job and it turned into an eight hour ordeal. So we started accumulating equipment and as of last year, I got a pretty well equipped bunch now and they can do their job. And it really helps on uh, worker comp claims and stuff if you got the right equipment. Because we used to have to jackhammer the holes out by hand, but now we do it with the Bobcat, so yeah. it saves a lot. One claim would probably pay for the back for the Bobcat at this day and age. Uh, so I continued to sewer main rehab after Pat left, and then I kept replacing water mains. And usually the way we know which ones we want to replace is we call them hot spots. They're typically the ones that are uh, breaking all the time. So we keep track of all that, and those are the ones that we typically are repaired or replaced. And my plan has always been to be, let me take a deep breath here. My plan has always been to be proactive and not reactive. So uh, things were going along pretty good until June 18th of 2011. <laughs> <laughs> my birthday. <laughs> I didn't even get my uh, birthday cake that year. And everybody else ended up eating it because I wasn't around. And that changed things at that point. We built a, needed to build a new plant. So that's what we did. And during that time, we continue to replace water mains. And the projects fund is not just for water main replacement, but it's for like painting the three million gallon water tank next year out there. And uh, putting the surge tank in down at Naples that we're still working on. They, they're gonna do the archeological dig in a couple of weeks, we think. We've been dealing with that for a year, trying to get them down there. But, and then cleaning the rainy well, and basically big ticket items. Uh, the line item for the project fund is just as important as any other line item, but usually the first one to take a hit when the budget time comes around, and that's in any community. But uh, other line items, you gotta pay for your chemicals, you gotta pay payroll, all those things you have to pay for, electricity, but typically, the project fund takes a hit because, you know, the water and sewer mains, they're in the ground, they're broken and stuff like that, but you fix them, but, but it's, that's the easiest thing because, you know, if you don't pay for your chemicals, your electricity, well, you know, you're done. So, uh, the five-year plan that we put out, always have, uh, they're not just projects I've dreamed up, but they're very important projects for the well-being of the utility. Uh, they're just not something, you know, I'd be tickled to death if we didn't have a five-year plan. 
but we don't live in those day and age. The infrastructure, what you see, you see, you guys see the streets, sidewalks, curb and gutter, building, bridges, those things you physically see on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you can tell when they're crumbling. But the water and sewer mains, everyone's hit. So you had to rely on me to, you know, let you know what we need. Uh, okay, I'll get one of the props out. <laughs> This is the coupon out of the water main at Tendi. As you can see, it's got a white film in it. That's a calcium carbonate coating. Um, we treat the water to put that coating on in there because that helps protect the water from the main. Uh, but this is a 50 year old main and that's really looks nice for a 50 year old main. Uh, but it's a fine line between treating the water where it's corrosive and not corrosive and putting down that calcium carbonate coating. But that's how we, that's what we do. Uh, so I guess the other one I'll bring out, this is a hundred year old water main piece. It's got a lot of buildup on it, calcium carbonate. Aesthetically, it doesn't look very good, but the water coming through it is perfectly fine because you know it's bacteria free and uh, this is just lime build up. But this is what a hundred year old water main looks like. That's the kind of build up in it. That's over on Harden. Uh, this is two, two reasons we need to replace water mains. One reason is that, plus structurally this may look sound but as soon as that pipe's put in the ground, it's trying to revert back to the original composition when it came out of the soil, so it's losing its strength. Negative and positive ions are going back into the soil all the time. So that's typically why we, we replaced old water mains is because they've lost their strength. And that one is 100 years old. Uh, can't imagine how much water has been through that thing. <laughs> And that's in good shape. Uh, yeah, because we haven't had any breaks on that down there, but typically water mains that were built 100 years ago are, were better built or made than the, newer, than the newer ones in like in the 50s or something. Uh, but it's at the end of its life. Uh, the utility department is the largest and most complex system the city owns. Or, you know, this, I'm giving you all this information so after I leave, when the budget comes around, things come around, you'll know more about the decision making. Because typically when I come up here and ask you for money for a project, I don't go into a lot of the, prop, the asset problems of the utility. Uh, we talk about that one little project and then you say yes and off we go. <laughs> <laughs> But I got an analogy here. The water plant is a factory, just like Reynolds and Nestle. We take in a raw product, lake and well water, and process it, and then the end product is sold to the consumer. The big difference is how that product is distributed. Nestle's and Reynolds have mostly trucking firms to get their product distributed. If a truck or trailer is at the end of its life, it is replaced, or if a distributor isn't doing their job, they're replaced. But we sell our finished product through our water mains. There was no other means to do the, this. And, uh, and the water and sewer mains, they don't have an infinite life. And I'm sure some customers think that, okay, we just spent $30 million on a new plant. Aren't we good to go? You know, because that's like any of you, if I came to where you work, and you try to explain to me in 10 minutes how you do your job, you know, it'd be tough. So I'm, I come up here and try to tell you guys, you know, I've been doing it 35 years. And you know, you guys have been out there about how complex the system is. But um, in the last 18 years since Pat showed up and then he left, we've replaced six miles of water main in the city. There's about 106 miles in the city. <laughs> but you got to start somewhere. You know, you can't. A lot of cities will borrow, like uh, 
Detroit, Michigan just bought, borrowed a half a billion dollars to replace water needs. But, uh, and uh, the thing about it is, is you need to understand we're not alone in this. Every community across the country is in the same spot. But each community, you know, they react in their own way. Because, you know, this isn't unique to us. Uh, I always felt it was best to put enough money in the projects fund to do what I needed to do on the five-year plan. There are many funding streams for infrastructure replacement and a lot of communities borrow money to do a big water and sewer project, but I always felt it was best to do some every year and pay as we go because if you borrow the money, there's a cost of getting the money and then the cost of paying it back. But if you pay as you go, 100% of that money goes into the projects. So, because it takes, it takes a lawyer and it takes engineers just to get the money and then you gotta pay the interest. So, and we're not trying to set a new world record here because you know, we've just been doing this piece every year. Uh, but with all utilities, there's a cost of just the daily running of a utility and the rates usually just cover this in most communities. And our utility has always put in enough in the budget to do the big ticket items and replace or repair water or sewer mains. And I hope this will continue because it is imperative that you get the water to the customer and the sewage away from them. The super new utilities of operations knows best what the utilities needs are. And I will say it again, that the engineers help with the numbers for the projects, but they never give me ideas. It's all for me. They help me put a number to it so I can have a good budget number for our budget. Because you know they have a very large group of people that will help me do that. Uh, so when you receive the next budget, it is important that everybody be involved in it and look carefully at the funding for the projects. Uh, and we all know it comes down to rates. We all know that. But you know, if if the new superintendent and the engineers and Mike Wumpel <laughs> can get an idea of okay, this is what we need to put in the projects fund, let's just keep this coming every year, just like you put in for the power bills or stuff like that. Uh, you've all been voted in to or appointed as council members, which makes you stewards of the city. It's now your responsibility to make sure the utility department can still move forward. Okay, that's a given. Uh, the day of reckoning, this is, I guess this is, I've been doing this for 35 years and uh, I've seen a lot of stuff, but I put this in here. The day of reckoning is coming at you like a runaway freight train and not just this community, but every community in the industrialized world out in front of the water plant. You know, we had that catastrophic failure of that valve and we lost water pressure over half the town. Those are the things that you can expect if, if you don't move forward with your infrastructure replacement. Uh, you're not gonna avoid it all because you've got a hundred miles of water main sitting out there. And, uh, but you know, you gotta keep plugging away at it. So as I come to the end of my tenure, I would like to thank the council members and the mayor past and present for all the city provided me during my employment. It was always truly appreciated and thanks to all my employees at the utilities and all department heads and personnel throughout the city. I thank them all. Uh, I got a good bunch of guys out there. Two of them sitting over there. So, um, I'd like to thank uh, Mike Wonkel for your help, and uh, Mayor Ezzard, and all the other, and then, uh, then we got Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Reggie and Jamie and, uh, oh God, there's Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, socks for you, Jack. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I just 
You know, I working at the utilities meant a lot to me, and I always cared about it. I know I didn't own it, so I did it's my responsibility <laughs> the last 13 years, but, uh, you know, you get, I'm kind of passionate about what I do, so I always want to do it right. But, uh, so, that's it. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I won't be as windy as Jack was, <laughs> but I do want I do want to take a few minutes to just kind of remember what Jack has been as a leader for the city's water and sewer department. I think he did a good job of summarizing some of it, but I want to kind of emphasize the commitment that went with that fateful day in June that I kind of forgot it was his birthday. Probably good that I did. <laughs> that the water treatment plant flooded. And you know, our first responders are put into positions all the time where they have to make heroic efforts. But in this case, your city utility department, led by Jack Cosner, actually had to make a heroic effort. And that's something that this community is far better off for having had that happen. He's led his team quietly most of the time. He really doesn't enjoy coming to speak before you. That's very uh, understandable. He spent countless hours reviewing the decisions that needed to be made at the existing water treatment plant. And then he was our technical leader on the new water treatment plant, making very good informed choices throughout the entire process. And then of course he was very involved during construction. And then I think that one of the things he said towards the end that I want to kind of emphasize to the council as well as the public that Jack never lost sight of the need to recommend reliable, cost-effective improvements to your water and sewer system facilities. So most of all, I think Jack Cosner is a great example of how individuals in our community can actually improve our daily lives through their work. So thank you, Jack. Mm -hmm. hey. This is going to be hard to follow there, Lori, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I just want to make a comment. Um, I was on the city council when Jack was hired as superintendent, and I remember Mayor Kendi uh, talking that he had the man that he wanted, but it was going to take a while to talk him into it. Because Jack was a man of few words. I think that you learned how to do more than a few words tonight. But uh, I think the mayor picked the, the, the right person at the time. We all agreed, and that's why he was doing what he did. But uh, he just he didn't do it just right on the spot. It took a while to talk him into it. Thank you, Jack. Very good. Everybody else? All right. Let's move on. Action Jackson is best. Good job. <laughs> Committee reports tonight, Parks and Lakes, Alderman Large Old Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have five items, and I'm going to be asking for some help from some folks that are here tonight. Our first item is discuss amending the rental hours and fees at the Community Park Center. I'll ask Kelly to speak about it. I'll ask Kip to speak about it. I'll ask Kip to speak about it. I feel like we'll be a pass around. All right. Uh, it, it came to my attention through my employees, who I respect a lot. There was a lot of difference in, in their charges in how the community center is rented out, and it just became confusing all the time. So what we've decided to do is kind of put it all together into it's not so confusing. So when you rent it out, we've got three times that we rent. Uh, also, the senior citizens, uh, senior group, they always have it Monday through Thursday up until five o'clock, I think, or four o'clock, something like that. So we changed that so that it's not even, you can't even rent it until five o'clock in the afternoon during that, during those four days. So it's just, a, we just kind of uh, corrected a few things on there and made it a little bit easier on my office and, and a little bit easier for the people that wanted to rent it so they know what they're charging. So that's, uh, that's where we're at with it. Kelly agreed and uh, we're going forward with some changes in the rates. <clears throat> it's not really costing a lot more. Anyone have any questions for Skip or to the senior center's fine? Yeah, they're they they've never we don't charge them. They just use it up until that point. The only time I think 
uh, we have needed to have them get out a little early sometimes, but they don't usually have a problem with it. So we work with them pretty good. They get it free. Okay, any other questions? No. Uh, the second item we have is discuss waiving bids and accepting the proposal for golf course building repairs. <coughs> and Keith wasn't able to be here tonight, but he and I uh, did have a chat, and I know we also talked with Skip prior to. Um, there, based upon the golf committee um, that was put together a couple of years ago, there were a lot of suggestions made on how we could improve the golf course. And Keith and I have met several times, um, as well as I know he's met with the mayor and some others too. Um, one of the priority items is really making the golf course um, more attractive um, so when people show up and see things are actually happening and can get excited. Um, so this is paint and they're going to be uh, fixing some of the facade and putting up some different sidage just to make it um, a more attractive um, a place. So he did get a, a bid from Hawkins Painting in the amount of $8,780.58. That was the low bid. And um, if we approve it this evening, they can get started right away. So we'll be able to see some improvements in the next couple of weeks. So what, what's the name of the company? Um, it, it's DG Hawkins. Mm -hmm. I think it was in your packet. Local company. <coughs> that, so is that something that other painting and companies in town got to crack at too? He did request several, and I know for sure that we got two people that were <coughs> turn in, and it was a low bid of the two. But we're not doing bids, we're just waiting. Yeah, we're still bid. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Right, and so this is the beginning. We'll be coming forward with some additional requests in the coming weeks, but this is something that we wanted to get started. You know, the weather's broke and we can get out there and get some things going and make it look sharper. So. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, the third item is discuss Jacksonville Area Baseball Lease, and I'm working on it with Kelly. Sure. I, I'd be bound to touch on it. Andy, do you want to talk about it a little bit? Well, I, mean, it, I think it's, it's not. Uh, yeah. uh, they approached us a, long, a couple of years ago. They've been back and forth. There, There's a dinner scheduled for Sunday um, to make an announcement, and it's out in the public. I talked about it this morning. Um, Mac Murray Baseball is going to partner with the, the 20 Colt folks. Um, and redo the field and basically start from scratch out there. We, we touched on it uh, a meeting a couple meetings ago. It's a win for the city. Um, you know, all we really had to do was extend the lease out. They wanted a little uh, security, which we all agreed that they need that because when you're starting from scratch. Um, so they worked it out with Jacksonville uh, baseball, the Pony Colt boys and, and, and we just look forward to a good long relationship with what with, with the vision of Mac Murray College what they want to do and, and local baseball so, um, if you're interested in going to the announcement it is on Sunday night at Hamilton's and I, I can get you information on that but um, coach our AD athletic director Justin Fuller wasn't able to make it here tonight um, but he gave me permission to just Move forward. Yeah, it's really good. There'll be a lot more to come as far as specifics on the, the fields and things, but this is just to, be, to firm up that the city is committed. With them. So, anything else, Dan? Did I cover that? Okay. okay. <laughs> good job, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. I'm hesitant in the next one here. Um, and number four is discuss partnership with Bob Freeze and YMCA. And I know we have representatives from the YMCA here. And Kelly. Um, I will take this okay. one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, over the winter, we've been talking about ways to, to promote the pool and try to do different things to get people out there and, and to get it used more. And, and this is kind of the quick version of what's been going on for quite a while out here. And, and I approached Mary Henry at the YMCA and, and we had a couple meetings and a couple discussions and, and we said, why can't we collaborate and why can't we um, become partners and, and utilize our pool to, to a little bit greater extent? 
And Mary, I think, without speaking for her, she's with us tonight, but I think she was excited and uh, uh, we kept talking about it a little bit and we've actually proceeded to the point where uh, we're working on uh, an actual schedule and, and some programs for our pool. Uh, what we're talking about doing is utilizing uh, a couple programs in the mornings. We don't even open our pool till 1230. So it can be utilized at times uh, while it's sitting idle right now. They, they are discussing some, some programs that they'd like to start and we think it'd be fantastic. It is not any uh, cost to the city to, to do this program, this partnership. We're just trying, we're gonna try it this year, see how it works out. We wanna get more people out there and this is an excellent way to get more people out there. Uh, we're also discussing working into our schedule, uh, maybe some afternoon programs with some kids. Uh, they have wonderful directors that are experienced in this kind of stuff. And, and so the more we can utilize them, that's, that's fantastic. And maybe an evening, uh, our evenings are, we rent the pool quite a bit for parties and things of that nature, but um, we're really trying to work the schedule out. Uh, Lori and, and our committee, we met, and we've already discussed it with committee, and the, I think the committee was very supportive. So we wanted, it's time, it's getting out into the public and everything, and we wanted to get this before you and hopefully get your support as well. Uh, moving forward with this partnership. And, and, and any questions, Mary and I would be glad to, to answer. Uh, again, this is a pilot program. We hope to see how it works this year. And, and uh, But it's, it's getting moms and kids and people into the pool and um, that maybe otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't have visited our pool. So um, I think it's, it could be a good thing for both of us. What kind of, what kind of programs are we talking about? Like swimming lessons? Uh, sure. Yeah, we're going to offer swimming lessons Tuesday and Thursday mornings. We'd like to. At three different times. We'll also have, we have a wonderful water fitness class for adults that we'll have there. Trying to do some water walking programs in the morning for arthritis patients or anybody who wants to just walk in the pool. The two o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to try and do a fun activity, uh, like a healthy exercise for the kids whether it's a penny drop or diving for something but also do water safety instruction then to a few minutes of that for everyone um we're going to also have an aqua zumba class on wednesday mornings so we're just trying to bring some our swim team will practice there some but the beauty of it is when it's rainy or cold we move it back to the y so we don't have to ever cancel a day so we're hoping we'll bring a whole new group of people out to a park pool and we're also going to work with all the daycares, trying to get them out there on a regular rotation in the afternoons, just to keep that pool full and busy. Oh, good. Okay. We're super excited about it. So, so excited. We'll support uh, this recommendation tonight and we'll start implementing it. Any other questions regarding that? And the fifth item we have is discuss the rules and regulations for the golf carts at Lake Jacksonville. And I believe you all received um, a packet in your folder this evening. I'm sure uh, Kelly can help answer any questions that you might have uh, regarding that. Right. This, if I can, Lori. Sure. What, what we did, what you have in your packets, we already have rules and, and that type of thing for golf carts. That we did that years ago. You know, we we just um, we elaborated on them a little bit, and then I put this in a pamphlet form that's a little easier to read than just like reading an ordinance book, you know, and, and trying to explain some things in this. And, and after tonight, with, with your support, I'm going to take this and make a three-fold brochure out of it. So we have, when someone registers a cart at, at the concession stand, we have brochures that we can hand to them and say, this is exactly what, you know, what we're doing, what we expect, and, and so on. So um, we're not recreating the rules, we just we just uh, are putting them in a spot under parks and lakes where they should be, where we can enforce them, and and then making a brochure with with this information that's in front of you here tonight. How has that been going? How how has the rules been followed? Do you think? Since well, I think they they've been okay, Tony. But we're going to have a lot more usage once we get this trail completed. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to wait until the last minute. I've got to get signs ordered. We've got to get preparation done um, before the trail is actually completed. So I, I, I want to have everything in order before that actually happens because 
it'll it'll happen this summer. We'll have it, you know, completed and and I, I want to be able to have everything ready to go. Good. I actually have three questions about the ordinance. Okay. Um, one might require uh, attorney gear, but um, on the specifications on the kind of models allowed. Mm -hmm. So you listed some specific companies and specific model numbers. Mm -hmm. So if EasyGo changes the CCs next year, or they get bigger, smaller, would that be a problem for you, or is it the first? Well, well I tell you what, Steve, where this came from, I didn't just pull this out of the air. Um, I made an appointment and went down and talked with the boys down at Rex Battery. Mm -hmm. You know, they deal with these all the time. And that this was actually some of their recommendations the most common models, the most common CCs and, and everything else, they said 95% of the golf carts you're gonna see are gonna be under these specific categories. And, and if they're souped up, hopped up, whatever, I, we don't want something down there running 50 mile an hour down our golf path, you know. So these recommendations came from them and, and, I, and I was appreciative of that. So, for, so if you, something changes in the future, we can take a look at it because this is a resolution form instead of an ordinance on one reading. We can make an adjustment to this. Yes, yeah, anything is always changeable. You know, if we find that we want to, that we have an issue we need to address, you know, we can always we can always address something that comes up. I guess the important thing to note in the minutes is that the main thing is the speed limit and the horsepower restrictions and the exact model numbers aren't the. Right. So as long as that could, yeah. I, I, so I know we just did an ordinance review, mm -hmm. and part, one part of that thing was to say a lot of the specifications would be administrative instead of laid out by the city council. So just want to make sure we're not. No, I think you're still okay. Okay. Then the second question I have was concerning the um, um, having open alcohol in the golf cart. So. Uh, Chief Mefford is next one, is he? Yeah. Oh, he's hiding. Oh, okay. So the question I have is, uh, it says you can't have open alcohols during outpouring, during operation. So what happens if you find someone and they pull over and then they're not operating, they're like next to the trail and they have open alcohol? Is that too specific that you can't kick them out of the lake? I don't know what you're asking. Are you asking if they're parked and we don't actually see them operating the, the golf cart? Right, they're operating the golf cart and they have open alcohol. And later on, you like whoever's doing the enforcement comes back and they're on the side of the path and they still have open, they have open alcohol. And then it's like, well, I didn't have open alcohol when I was operating. I have open alcohol on the side. Is that kind of like a way you can weasel out of getting kicked out? Or is that too specific? Probably too specific. That's going to be at the discretion of the officer at that point. Um, more to it than just are they standing there drinking? Were they causing a problem? Are they outside the ramifications of the lake rules, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But as far as operating with open alcohol, that that would be enforced just like we would anything else. Okay, but it's kind of too specific. You'd have to actually take it event by event. Um, obviously, if they're driving down the path drinking, that's an easy one for us. Right. If the, they're parked along the way and somebody's having a beer. It's going to be a discretion of the officer of what that circumstance that point is. Okay, and I guess we were trying to get, we we're trying to limit the discussion that we're trying to say that the trail is not a place to be drinking and driving. So that was one concern I had. So you think it's still enforceable? I think it would just be along the lines of the right rules. You know, Alderman Cook, you were a chief for many years. Do you have any opinions on that? Well, I, I have to agree with that. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a real decimal call here because you, first off, you're going to have to see him doing it. I mean, if you got a golf cart standing there, maybe it might be their golf cart, maybe you'd be standing there having a beer. And I guess yeah. the question is, do you want to completely ban alcohol on the trail of any kind? That's, that may, well, I mean, I guess if someone's walking, I, I, I don't know. But yeah, if someone's, that's the question. If, if you get much more specific than this, that you can't be standing beside your golf cart with a beer or mm -hmm. seeing your golf cart with a beer but not operating, mm -hmm. then you're really getting to the point where you're not allowing alcohol on the trail at all, mm -hmm. which would then have to apply to any campers or hikers or whatever else. Mm -hmm. there. So what do you do with alcohol, like open drinking alcohol at the lake? Does it have to be in the campsite or can mm -hmm. it just be anywhere? Anywhere, I believe. I don't think there's any restrictions on that. Yeah, we don't generally have much problem with that. Okay. Then, you know. If it gets to be a problem, I can always take another look. 
Yeah. Well, in that case, she was going to be intoxicated driving. And it's one of the kind of Those are the things that you really want to uh, emphasize and target. <clears throat> not staying inside your golf cart having a beer. Yeah, I guess what it would be good to they have the city council come forward and it would be good to have the council say it's like this isn't this is a place for everyone, not for people in golf carts with drinking. So that's why I'm just trying to make sure that we're, we're agreeing to that. So are we prohibiting alcohol on the golf trail? I mean, on the no, no. is that what you're asking? No, I'm not going for that. I'm oh. just going like they can't be having alcohol in golf carts as we're going along. Open container. Right. And I'm trying to make sure there's no, like, you know, lawyerly speak, sorry, Dan, to say that you can get out of it. Like, oh, I'm not operating. I'm just sitting standing next to the trail. Even though you saw me earlier driving on the trail, now I'm standing next to it. Steve, I know one of the things you mentioned during our meeting that I'm not seeing here, and I can't remember where that discussion went regarding the prioritization of who has the right of way on the trail. Oh, that was my next question. It's um, in there. It's in is there. it? I read it. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's in there. But as far as the bikes, then all right, I read it. What? Well, there's the bikes that are allowed to trail right right away at all times. Okay, so we're gonna number four. Okay. Well, Steve and Russ, if you want to give us, we can have a first reading tonight, and then you can. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with the first two, as okay. long as everyone's fine. We kind of like have all had the same agreement. Um, it's just oh, a resolution. Sorry, I sorry, I forgot about that. Um, but yeah, it, and, and then number four <clears throat> on the general rules, it says wash for children, and later it says the pedestrians and, and uh, bicycles have the right of way. So should we change watch four to yield two? Would that be better instead of having it be one or the other? Well, I tried to make these read like common sense, you know, like easy to read and, and not like reading a rule book, mm -hmm. you know, so there's some easier language in there that you'll find because this is going to be a pamphlet mm -hmm. that we hand out. So I don't want it to re read like a, like a dictionary, you know, so that's why some of the language is worded the way it is. There you go. It's just that simple. So saying watch for and then yield to or right away later is okay? The way it's written, pedestrians and bicycles uh, are allowed to trot the trail right away at all times. Um, we can change that just like shall have the right away at all times. And what do you think would be? And I think there's th that's something that most trails, they have a priority. Or it's people on feet first and people on bicycle first. You know, right. This is where adding the carts. And you're, yeah. you're handling that with signage and everything. So. Well, however you want to do it, I, I thought it's covered, but whatever, however you want to do it. Steve, do you feel more comfortable with the suggestion that Dan offered? Do you think that makes it more clear? Sure. Because we can make that. Are you good with that? Yeah, go ahead. Right. 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 I'll get it from Dan. Okay. Okay. Any other any other questions for Kelly regarding the golf cart policy? So what was okay. that? Pedestrians. Uh, uh, no. uh, paragraph shall have. B, the last sentence: Pedestrians and bicycles shall have the right of way at all times. So change the hard shell. Yes. Or do we need to amend that later? Or is it just? No, we'll just change that now. Right now. It's, it's, it's a change. change. Okay. So now it'll be yep. read in that. Thing. Okay. <clears throat> And you really noted about your concern regarding the, the first stop point under general rules and regulations. And I think it's something that Adam and, and Adam and Kelly will, can bring to our attention if we need to adjust it. And it says that under on the first page, management reserves the right to amend these rules and regulations at any time. So you can always come back and make those adjustments. So that's all we have tonight. Thank you. Very good. Planning and public works. Alderman Bill Scott. Mr. Mayor, we have two items. The first item is to discuss waiting bids and accepting proposal for Long Spring. And that's for the downtown spring. I'll hand that over to Cherry. And I'd like to just defer to Jack because he did such a good job. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most I've ever heard him talk. <laughs> 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 
white flags stay off the grass. <laughs> uh, I contacted five different companies for uh, five springs of uh, grass areas all through the downtown over uh, the north by the railroad tracks and then uh, spraying for beetles uh, whenever they come out and I got back five different uh, proposals and a low proposal was from Sands Mowing here in Jacksonville and it was for $3,382 and if we pay it in one lump sum right at the beginning it'll knock it down to $3,145.72. <coughs> And he's the one that's been doing it last or the, the last four or five years, so I'm very comfortable with them. Any questions? Just like Jack said, when the flags are up, stay up. <laughs> there you go. Right. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Uh, the second item is to discuss TIF application. And Mr. Kelly, are you I'm sure? Of that one? Sure. Uh, I have an, an application received in our office uh, from. Uh, a uh, Mr. Ed Killam, and I don't know if Mr. Killam is with us tonight. Is Mr. Killam here? Okay, uh, we tried to contact him today. I just wasn't sure if he was going to show or not. This is a pretty straightforward project, so I, I doubt you'll have any questions. Uh, Mr. Killam owns the Antiquarius, is that right? Building on the corner of the plaza, it's 19 South Central. Uh, he would like to put a new roof. On that building, as you know, that building is in excellent condition, and uh, it's it's one of our nicer buildings downtown, and and we certainly would like to help him keep it that way. Uh, the roof for the total project is twenty three thousand three eighty or three forty eight, and uh, during our TIF review committee meeting, it was suggested that we do fifty percent of the eligible cost, or a maximum of eleven thousand six seventy four. <clears throat> okay, any questions I can answer? We would like to move forward and help Mr. Kilm with these buildings. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Uh, utility owner in the wall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I have one item tonight. <coughs> Before we get to that, I'd like to, on behalf of myself and the utility committee, you know, we have a lot of different uh, superintendents throughout the city, and one of the more important ones, I think, is Jack Cogner's job. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's done a very good job. I don't think I've ever worked with anybody as passionate as Jack. I mean, he, that's his baby. He takes care of uh, the daily activities like it's his own, and I just want to thank Jack for personally taking care of uh, all of us in the whole city because a lot of people just go to work and do their job and go home. Jack don't do that. Jack takes it personally and uh, <coughs> sits through a lot of meetings with him and on behalf of the mayor and the guys at Benny. Uh, just thanks, Jack. Uh, we, can't, we can't say enough or do, in, do enough for Jack as he uh, goes on and retires and travels around in his camper or does whatever he wants to do. <laughs> But hopefully he'll respond to some phone calls or text if we need And thank goodness, you know, we do have Balin down there to carry on some transition and with Rick thank Aaron and guys right. down there. I think hopefully Jack's leaving us in good hands and Rick and the guys got some big shoes to fill. So thanks, Jack. Number one, discuss bids for sale of surplus vehicles. Basically, these are uh, vehicles that uh, weren't worthy of a trade-in when we got ready to purchase new. You guys got a list of them in your email. Um, we'll put them out for bids. People bid on them, and that's what we received in your email. Any questions? Uh, Um, any public comment at this time? Well, before we go to the next meeting, um, everybody please give this, this cake. This is the gift we give Jack. It's not just for <laughs>
cake and crunch, but uh, obviously it's for Jack, it's for a bill leaving, it's for our newly elected alderman, and Brandon and Aaron, just to welcome them and uh, make sure you have a piece of cake and get some punch. It'll be available after the regular meeting too, but if you wanna partake right now, feel free. And, and I know it says no food and drink in there, but Terry, I'm sorry. But thank you. Uh, no, 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 no,